evening. It's my privilege to welcome you. My name is Tom McCall. For those um, who haven't yet met, I teach theology here and serve as a director of the center. We're really pleased this evening to have a conversation on um, an issue that may sometimes be seen a bit arcane and is often overlooked, but yet is important in a number of ways. And we're really pleased to see you here this evening, uh, honored by your presence. Thankful you bring the elements out there, and uh, we're ready to begin this evening. I'll turn this over to Professor Richard Aberbeck in just a moment. He serves as the director of our PhD program in theological studies here, and is a professor of Old Testament. He will be moderating this evening's event, and he will introduce the other participants. But first, let's begin, as we should, with prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for this day, for this opportunity we have. We pray that we will come to a better understanding of you and your works and your ways in our world. And we pray, Lord, that you will give us clarity of mind, charity of heart. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Well, good evening, uh, both here in the drench <laughs> uh, of the rain this evening and uh, on, the, on the live stream. That's intended. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I welcome you uh, to this discussion, which is entitled, And the Genealogies Beget Controversies uh, History and Theology and Biblical Genealogies. And this is a very important subject for the study of early Genesis. Uh, our uh, speakers will be William Barrett, Richard Hess, and Peter Lightheart. And we thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your presence here with us tonight. The procedure will be that I will just, I'm, I'm in the process of introducing the topic and the participants and, and so on. Uh, I am going to introduce each of the participants just before they come to speak for the first time. The opening statements will be 60 minutes total, 20 minutes for each. Uh, Dr. Barrick will go first, then Dr. Hess, and then Dr. Lightheart. Okay? Then, after that 60 minutes, that there will be another 30 minutes of formal responses. Okay? Where in the same order, there will be responses to the other two uh, papers. Okay? The two positions. Then, there will be questions from the audience. Uh, there will be uh, microphones that can be uh, uh, available. There's one up there, I guess. Uh, and, and you can, I don't know if there's another. But uh, there, oh yeah, over there. So <clears throat> the idea is that you can just go to the microphone and then we can introduce, you can, you can uh, state your questions. Okay? So we'll have maybe 15, 20 minutes, maybe more for <clears throat> Discussions. You might want to think about that as we head into the time. Uh, we will plan to stop at least uh, no later than 9.15, okay? It's set for two hours. Uh, let me see, is there anything else I need to say? I think that's, that's pretty much uh, what I need to say. Uh, what I want to do at first, then, is just introduce our first uh, uh, speaker. That's Dr. William Barrick. In 2015... Dr. William D. Barrick transitioned from serving as Old Testament professor at the Master's Seminary in Sun Valley, California. He now devotes himself to a writing ministry, serving as the Old Testament editor for the Evangelical Exegetical Commentary series by Logos Lexum, uh, for which he is writing the Genesis volume, teaching around the world in pastoral training centers associated with the Master's Academy International, and enjoying his transition years with his wife, Barbara, their four married children, and 14 grandchildren. Bill and Barbara have uh, served as missionaries in Bangladesh for 15 years of his 52-year ministry. He has many publications, including Bible translations, books, journal articles, and book reviews. He also serves as a biblical editor for the Creation Research Society Quarterly. Let's welcome Dr. Barrick. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Averbeck. It's good to be here, and it's a privilege to be here on the Trinity campus and to participate in uh, this symposium. It's a joy to be able to uh, address you, and it's a joy to be able to talk about the biblical genealogies. As I begin tonight, uh, the topic that I'm carrying on with is mainly the historical and theological aspect in Genesis chapters 5 and 11. And I know right away everyone's saying, you know, why genealogies? Aren't we told to avoid endless genealogies and speculations? And yet I don't think Paul is talking about the consideration of the biblical genealogies. He's talking about things that uh, the ancient Jewish people would get involved in and debate that uh, we don't have to get involved in as believers. But he did not intend by that for us to ignore the genealogies in the Old Testament nor anywhere else. And as we approach the problems of the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, we have four key areas that we need to look at. And the first has to do with the textual critical matters. How much can we depend upon the text that we have in front of us? Is it sound? Uh, does it have integrity? Is it authentic? Uh, can it be established? Secondly, the internal exegetical problems. Uh, we want to approach it exegetically. We want to interpret it accurately. We want to be those who rightly divide the word of truth. And then we want to take a look at the analysis of the Genesis genealogies. Uh, once we've interpreted, what does all of this mean? Where do we go with it? And of course, a topic that uh, Dr. Hess will be covering in greater detail has to do with the comparison with the ancient Near Eastern uh, background and the ancient Near Eastern histories and king lists. So let's go back to the textual character and take a look, first of all, at Genesis chapter 5. One thing that we would expect in this text, if it were not authentic, if it were not historical, if it were not accurate, we'd expect a, all the numbers to be rounded. And we don't find rounding in numbers. We find numbers like 807, 912, 815, 162. We find numbers that it's difficult to consider to be uh, numbers that were just chosen and rounded off, either rounded up or rounded down. They appear to be authentic numbers. Now, it's true that it, some have analyzed these numbers and say there's a large uh, amount of the factors of seven and five in them. And those should have to also be taken into consideration and to try to see if something of that nature does pan out in looking at the genealogies. And as far as we look at the text itself, uh, Avram Tal in the uh, Biblia Hebraica Quinta has said that the text of Genesis 5 is pretty sound. There are very, very few textual problems. The differences have more to do with the recensions, uh, with the Septuagint and with the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, where you have differences in the chronologies that are used and the numbers that are given. But the Masoretic text is fairly complete and is sound and has unity in its testimony. So there are very few textual critical issues of note that would cause us to say that we should revise the Masoretic text. Rather, the Masoretic text can, text can stand, but we have to then consider the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch alongside it. So we would stand with the integrity of the Masoretic text as it stands right now. If the genealogy is closed, in other words, there are strict, uh, a strict chronology here, where there is no wiggle room and no gaps, it would mean that the flood started 1,656 years after Adam, if you're looking at the Masoretic text. But when we look at the other recensions, the Samaritan Pentateuch would make it 1,307 years after Adam, and uh, Septuagint A with Alexandrinus would make it 2,262 years after Adam, and the Septuagint B, Vaticanus, would make it uh, 2,242 years after Adam. We'll talk more about that, but notice that the difference here is only 606 years between these texts. The, the difference is not huge. It is not so outstanding that it causes totally new and different revelations. It essentially says that the text as we have it in any of these four can be dealt with as a uh, text with integrity and authenticity. And then we go to the historical credibility that also seems to indicate the textual character of Genesis 5. The names do refer to real people. We see that both in the narratives themselves that are supporting the genealogies, or we'd actually say the genealogies support the narratives. 
And we see it in later genealogies throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. These are real people. Uh, we, we look at them and, and we know that these are people that are part of biblical history and part of the early history of our planet. So they're real people. They introduced narratives. The geographical details are also historically accurate and dependable. There are very few histor uh, historic or geographical details given in the genealogies in 5 and in 11. But in the narratives themselves, there are some. And then Genesis 5, according to Wenham, gives no hint that there were large gaps between father and son. That's reading in itself. But when we begin to read the rest of Scripture, that's where we begin to have the questions arise. We begin then with the assumption that what we have before us in Genesis 5 ought to be taken at face value. But we're going to move on. It's also, according to John Walton, that this, this text in Genesis 5 is significant historiographically. It has integrity as a history. The marks, again, of real people, real names, names that fit the times, uh, the events in the narratives, the cultural background in the narratives, the geography in the, in the narratives, lend itself to its historical nature. In 1930, Skinner, in the International Critical Commentary series, believed that the omissions from Genesis 5 had been universally discredited. Now, he has a very liberal theological viewpoint, and he at times deals very freely with the biblical text. But on this point, he said that he believed that any omissions from the genealogy in Genesis 5 had been universally discredited. That has changed somewhat in the years intervening. And part of it has to do with an examination of uh, the Gospel of Luke. And that's what happened to reignite the debate. The debate had been going on long before we've come along about the genealogies. Uh, I tell my students, you know, if you're talking about something new, be careful. If it's really new, you're probably wrong. Because usually someone else has already thought of it before you. And both sides of this issue are things that have been discussed for centuries. It's not a new discussion or new, de new debate that we're having. On the exegetical consideration, secondly, we move to the idea that the additional evidence that is required as we go through the text, as we exegete it, we notice that one of the key verbs, the verb yalad, has to do with giving birth to or siring or fathering. And we see that in the hifil stem throughout the genealogies in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. And when we look at it, we find out that it has to do with more than just the fathering or the siring or the production of the immediate generation. And it has more to do than just the one person who is named. When you have Adam begot Seth, that's very clear that he is the third child that was begotten. Abel is dead, killed by his brother Cain. And as we go to chapter 5, verse 32, we have Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But we know from other scripture, as in Genesis chapter 9, that Shem is not the older, is not the oldest of these three. And therefore, you're talking about a gap in time here and a reference to one who is not the firstborn son. So the age of Noah at the time that he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth unless they were triplets, is not the same for each son. And we have to ask the question then, is his age a reference to the key individual theologically? Or is it a reference to his firstborn regardless of the theological context? And that inserts then a factor of change with regard to the amount of time that's involved in the overall chronology of the genealogy. In Genesis 11:26, we have the same situation with Terah, he begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Again, Abram is probably not the firstborn. We compare his age when he left Haran and the time of his father's death, as recorded in the book of Acts, we end up recognizing that there's something here that doesn't quite fit, especially if we're going to see Abram born to uh, Terah uh, 
when Terah was the age that is recited there in Genesis 11:26. It does not work out. So you end up again with some time that may be involved there that is not considered and does not allow us then to have an absolute chronology in the genealogy. When we look at this, there's more than just those three sets of three sons. We also have the same verb in the same stem used in Deuteronomy 4.25 of the begetting of grandchildren and beyond, great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 18, Hezekiah begets descendants who will be in the exile. And we look at that, and we find that's 100 years ahead of the time. So that as we begin to look at this, we begin to see that we have to ask the question, Genesis 5, is the one who is begotten and named the son, the grandson, the great-grandson, who is he? How does that figure out? Again, as we read it very clearly and very closely, the wording is such that we would expect it to refer to the son and the father, the son and the father, and that appears to be confirmed by the similar genealogy that's given in Chronicles and also given in Matthew and Luke. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 45, you have future children of the future resident aliens who will become Israel's slaves in the distant future. They are begotten. So from an exegetical viewpoint, we can argue from the use of the verb in the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 that there could be a potential of gaps in the genealogy, that it might not have an absolute chronology. Again, I'll emphasize that the wording of chapter 5, especially the way it's formulated and the way the geneal genealogical lines are repeated in Chronicles, in Matthew, and Luke, it appears that there's very little room there for much addition of many years. But that does not rule out the extension of perhaps Genesis chapter 11. What I found interesting from uh, Dr. Hess's presentation at, at Evangelical Theological uh, Society's meetings in November was the, the point here that there are some irregularities in the way that we have the genealogies written, especially in chapter 11. The, the normal form of the verb for yalad in the genealogies has been an imperfect or a wayiktol form of the verb. But suddenly in chapter 11, verses 12 and 14, we have two perfects being used, and it's the verb chaya. Now, the verb chaya occurs in Genesis chapter 5, that so-and-so lived so many years and begat sons and daughters, and then he continued to live, and then after he begat sons and daughters, then he died. But as we're looking at that, this is a different form of the pattern, and it's a break. It's an irregularity. Whenever there's an irregularity, we need to stop and think, why? Why is there an irregularity? And the interesting thing about this, it occurs exactly when we're talking about Shela. And Shela, in his area of the genealogy, is where the problem occurs with the addition of Canaan in Luke chapter 3. Could it be that that's what's involved? Could it be that we don't understand all that's written here about Arphaxad and Shelah and Canaan in Genesis 11? Could it be that in Genesis 11, there's a greater degree of the possibility of gaps than there is in Genesis chapter 5? So when we compare the genealogies, we have a number of comparisons to be done. We can do how many generations are listed in the genealogies. In Genesis 4, in Cain's genealogy, there are eight generations. And uh, we have Noah being the tenth individual from Adam, and Abram is the tenth from Shem in those two genealogies. Ruth chapter 4 is divided into ten generations uh, between Perez and David. And Luke chapter 3, verse 33, inserts into that paradigm of ten names at least one, if not three, additional names. And I would refer you to Daryl Bach's excellent commentary on Luke in dealing with this issue that it's not just a matter of taking the one name Cain in Luke chapter 3 and trying to do away with it and then settling on the uh, steadfastness and strictness of Genesis 5. We have to think again about the whole issue. We have to go back and take a look at the additions that are made there in the various manuscripts in the Gospel of Luke. When we compare with the uh, Numbers genealogies and Exodus genealogies and Chronicles genealogies, we find an interesting pattern. We have Nachshon, uh, 
who aids Moses in taking the census in Numbers chapter 1. He, le he led the tribe of Judah every time that the uh, nation of Israel set out to march in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 2, verse 3. And as we look at that, in David's line of 10 or 11 generations, and we look back at that, there's a huge difference here. How can Nashon be in the line where he's at, in the line of David, and still be living at the time of the Exodus? And even if you shorten the time and you take a late date of the Exodus, there's still a problem because you have not shown being born about the time of the late date of the Exodus. So in all of this, we see that there's a consistent problem, that the genealogies do not always fit the rest of the patterns of the narratives, and we cannot reach a strict gene, uh, genealogical uh, chronology. Interestingly, when you look at David's line in Chronicles, and you compare it to Samuel's line, David has 10 generations, in some counts 11, whereas you have Samuel's line leading up to Heman in the priestly line, the Levitical line, 20 generations. As we look at that, it, it becomes a problem because in David's line, no one would be able to give birth if it's a strict chronology and a strict genealogy with no gaps, it would mean everyone gave birth after they turned 80 years of age. Whereas the Levitical line, everyone gave birth around the age of 21 to 24. So the question there, the difficulty, shows us that there is a problem in the biblical genealogies if we're trying to take them as a strict chronology. Uh, it's also been pointed out by Gene Merrill in his commentary on Chronicles in the Craigle Exegetical Library series that there are 22 uh, different uh, descendants or different generations given for Kohath, only 15 for Gershom, and 14 for Merari. And just looking at that comparison suggests there are missing names. And that has significance to the issue as well. It ends up, when we take a look at this, there are 400 years between Korah and Heman, approximately 21 years of age for each fathering, if it's a strict chronology. Whereas you have the 400 years between Nashon and David, approximate age of 80 for each fathering. And that's where we have the difficulty. In Luke chapter 3, verse 36, we have Canaan. And he's inserted in the text, and some would like to get rid of it. The textual evidence is kind of mixed. And you could argue for either retaining it or getting rid of it. But if you get rid of it, there's still an additional problem there, as Daryl Bach has pointed out that there are at least two other names also that may be needed to be included at that point. Why would Luke insert Canaan and have as the only basis or testimony perhaps the Septuagint? Well, perhaps because that was the version of the biblical text that the people of the day were using, and that he was using that because it was familiar to them and that it was available to them. We have other writers like in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, citing uh, the Septuagint for Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, which is not found in the Masoretic text. And even if you argue that it should not be part of inspired scripture, it is still part of the literature which was known by the people of the time, and it helped him to make the point he was making in Hebrews chapter 1 about the superiority of the sonship of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, we have a pagan poet cited, Aratus, same in Titus with Epimenides. And then, of course, Jude 14, we have an apocryphal book, First Enoch, cited by Jude. Uh, it doesn't mean that those works are being treated as inspired by the writers. They're being used because the people are familiar with those writers, and something they have said helps to make the point that the writer of Scripture is making. And I think that that could very well be what happened in Luke chapter 3 as well. Dwayne Garrett in his Exodus commentary says, we must realize that we are reading an ancient book in which things are described according to the standards of ancient people when we're looking at the genealogies. And that means it will not always follow the same standards that we think are proper for genealogies. When we look at Amran and Jochebed as the parents of Moses, there's a problem there as well. It just does not work out exactly. Or we go to Matthew 1.5 and we see Rahab and her placement in the line of Jesus Christ, in the line of David, 
creates a problem because there's a 371 year difference at the maximum between when Rahab the harlot lived and the woman named Rahab in the text when we look at the overall genealogy. Now, I doubt very much that the writer meant anything other than Rahab the harlot of Jericho. Otherwise, I think he would have described and, and mentioned it because to the readers, they're familiar with that Rahab. It makes no sense for it to be anyone else. So that proves that you have hundreds of years missing which we are familiar with Matthew because he shortened the genealogies in order to fit a 14-generation pattern, which is typical and is not totally unusual. Matthew 1.8, from Joram to Uzziah omits three kings, the son of Joram, Ahaziah, then Joash and Amaziah are all missing. Every single one of them are gone. And as we go further in this line, and compare this, I'll just, I'm going to say this, then skip to the summary. Uh, James Borland said, you would need a hundred generation gap in Genesis 5 to move man's history back a mere 16,580 years. You'd have to insert 10 different missing names between all 10 names in order to just get that amount of time in there with the average age. It does not work out well. Let me move ahead here very quickly to, I'm going to skip over the purposes of the genealogies. I want to cover just the summary in the end here. There's so much to be said. I knew this was going to happen. I'd get short, and it did. I want to summarize this way. The ancient versions of Genesis 5 and 11, there's at least 606 years here that can be played with. The most extreme of the king list would give us 432,000 years, but that's acknowledged as being mythological and no one seriously considers inserting that age gap in there. The gaps next to 6 in Matthew 1 equal 200 and 100 years respectively to add in to the overall chronology. The date for the Exodus, depending on which date you take, could be off plus or minus 400 years. The genealogy's own gaps can amount to 700 to 800 years. The problem with ancient civilizations and the creation of mankind can push the whole thing back to 8,000 years total for the history of man, back as far as 25,000, which Morris and Whitcomb hypothesized years ago. Even with gaps, a judicious exegesis yields nowhere near millions of years or even hundreds of thousands of years. The biblical genealogies, the age of mankind, is what we would be focused on, not the age of the earth or the universe. That's another issue and would have to be dealt with separately. And the age of the earth must be resolved exegetically from the creation narratives and subsequent revelation. And the age of the earth between its creation and creation of mankind, I believe, rests on Exodus 20, 11. I'll leave that for you to look at. And my conclusion is hundreds to a few thousand years only do I see any leeway, not millions of years or even hundreds of thousands of years. And I would conclude this with a statement by John Walton. We need to defend the teaching of the text, not a scientific reconstruction of the text or statements that are read between the lines of the text. Just go back to the text and work with it. And that's what I've attempted to do. It's not convinced me there's a huge gap in here, but I think it's unquestionable there are gaps in the genealogies. And it yet needs for us to resolve those and determine exactly how much time is there. And I would rest somewhere personally around 8,000 years for the age of, the, of mankind, at least, if not the earth. Thank you. Somehow it wasn't coming through right. <laughs> okay. Dr. Richard Hess is Distinguished Professor of Old Testament at Denver. Dr. Hess has authored nine books, most recently the Old Testament, a Historical, Theological, and Critical Introduction. Other books, books include volumes such as Israelite Religions, a Biblical and Archaeological Survey, and commentaries on Leviticus, Joshua, and the Song of Songs. He has edited or co-edited 30, co 33 books, Dr. Hess has published more than 100 scholarly articles and collected essays and journals. Dr. Hess earned a PhD 
from Hebrew Union College, an MDiv and THM from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and a BA from Wheaton College. He has done postdoctoral research at various universities and has held National Endowment for the Humanities, Fulbright, and Tyndale House, Cambridge postdoctoral fellowship grants. We welcome you to the board. Thanks very much. It's an honor to be here and uh, with such an auspicious and select crowd. Um, could we uh, go on to uh, my PowerPoint, please? What do I have to do? What? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, good. It works. Okay. Um, let's go right into this. What I want to do here is using ancient Near Eastern materials to study the Genesis genealogies and ask, can we do that, or what does that look like? Uh, review some of the key aspects of the history of this study, especially dealing with Genesis 4, 5, and 11, and suggest how comparative material may shed light on questions about the genealogies. And then I want to look at the text and analysis on Genesis 5 and 11, and literary comparisons, especially with the king lists, and the personal names in the king lists, where not, uh, which have not been studied as much. And what does that say about the origin contributions of comparative material? So we begin with uh, something. What is that? Uh, that is a picture of the Sumerian king list, but it's not a good one. Um, it's been distorted uh, in the process of getting up here. But uh, you can go on. What is it, CDL? or uh, They have a really nice, beautiful picture. Looks like the Borg uh, in uh, Star Trek. But anyway, uh, Torquil Jakobsen uh, really put the thing together in publishing in 1939, a pre-flood. Uh, he noted that there is, it began with a pre-flood list, uh, excuse me, began with a king list of which the pre-flood, the antediluvian list, was added later, composed with the pre-flood uh, pre list circa 2000 BC, maybe the third dynasty of Ur. A um, little bit later, Erika Reiner put together four texts with the help of Benno Landsberger and reconstructed an important tradition about the seven Apkalu. Those are the four texts. But the point about this is these Apkalu are not kings, they're sages, and they deal, uh, they're described as pre-flood Puradu fish of the sea, but with great intellect. Um, this was echoed many centuries, even millennia later, by Barossus uh, in his discussion of Oannes and fish monsters in the whole uh, context of giving crafts of civilization to humanity. The Apkalu are these Paradu fish, are the uh, figures that Barossus refers to as giving crafts of civilization, echoed through Greek tradition and figures like Prometheus and some of the Titans and others. Each Apkalu, however, in the earliest traditions corresponds to a king. And in this way, it, has, it was compared with the line of Cain in Genesis 4. Finkelstein, uh, in his uh, uh, study of the pre-flood king list, where kings reign this enormous amount of time, 6,000 to 72,000 years higher. This is not a list from before the flood in the sense that it was composed then, but a list that claims that these kings ruled before the flood, much higher than what you find in Genesis 5. But nevertheless, comparisons were made. The Apkalu and the pre-flood kings, because you have one Apkalu connected to each king, have been compared with Genesis 4 and that line of Cain and Genesis 5 and the line of uh, Seth. Both have dual lines, Apkalu pre-flood kings, Genesis 4 and 5. Both have long lives of the second line, in which the pre-flood kings live thousands, as a rule, thousands, tens of thousands of years. At Genesis 5, as you know, that's Methuselah and others who live hundreds of years. The first line does not continue post-flood. The Apkalu don't continue except one, one Apkalu figure does show up post-flood, but basically they stop. The second line does continue, and that's the case with Genesis 4 and 5 as well. Similar names in both. In the uh, Sumerian material, you have Enmegalana and Anmegalana, and you can read some of the, the, the other example there. I'm not going to try. 
Uh, Enoch, Lamech are both found in Genesis 4 and 5, similar names. And Methushael sounds a little bit like Methuselah in 4 and 5. Now, in 1977, with all this information coming out, Will, Wilson began, went back, uh, Robert Wilson, and looked at genealogy and history in the biblical world and argued that there is a fluidity in the Genesis genealogies on the basis of anthropological comparisons with modern, tri modern study, anthropological study of tribal genealogies. Genesis 4 and 5 thus come, for him, come from the same source, but were put to different purposes. The order and the names were changed, but they really come from one list. Lambert, in his review of this, argued that uh, it doesn't quite work that way. The Sumerian king list from the third millennium had no interest in descent from one line to establish legitimacy. But the old Babylonian first dynasty uh, uh, king lists of Babylon showed an Amorite interest in descent. So, and that's West Semitic, similar to what we have in the Bible. So there does seem to be an interest in descent. And there may have been different purposes for different king lists. Certainly by the second millennium BC, king lists are built from Babylonian year name lists and Assyrian limu lists, which are chronological. While parentage is not crucial, that so-and-so was the father of so-and-so or whatever, the sequence is essential to establish systems for reckoning time. So for Lambert, there is evidence for dates and times that were stable rather than fluid in this early material, which is, goes against the Wilson and this kind of anthropological input that saw them as fluid because certain modern tribal traditions have that kind of a setup. David T. Bryan also uh, wrote an article which is important. He criticized Wilson over his broad generalizations about common origins. The Apkalu list, you remember the sages, and the Sumerian king list did not originate together. They don't appear there separate in their earliest occurrences. Similarities, therefore, do not necessarily assume that it's the same line just because you have similar names in both of them. The Hammurabi list and the Assyrian list are clearly not identical, and yet, as we'll see, we have early, and these are from the second millennium BC, we have early kings in both of those that seem to be coming from the same names. Genesis 4 and 5, the lists therefore do not necessarily come from the same origins, but they may reflect two separate uh, lists, two separate lines, uh, going back, to be sure, to a common origin. I published in 1989, I think it was, a, some, a study on the differences between genealogies of Genesis 111 and the ancient Near Eastern king lists. Context in this must have priority over comparison. The Sumerian king list has no regular genealogical notices other than son of Dumu in the logographic reading. The same is true of the Lagash king list as well as the Babylonian and Assyrian king list. The Hammur Hammurabi list only has names, one name right after another, like you find in, uh, for example, in First Chronicles. Genesis 5 and 11 have son always appearing, but also notes about begetting, as uh, Bill uh, explained. The ancient Near Eastern king lists begin with the latest generation and tend to work back in time. This is true even when the list begins with the earliest king, as with the Assyrian king list, where the second group clearly begins with the latest ruler, the second group of kings begins with the latest ruler and ends with the earliest ruler. There's, unlike Genesis, they're always looking back in time to an ideal past or a ruler that they want to connect with. The Apkalu list and their corresponding kings uh, are two different lists. The same is true of Genesis 4 and 5. In the ancient Near East, you have kingship. In Genesis, you have kinship. So there's a number of different differences between the king lists and the kinship lists in Genesis. Combined with the forward movement in time, this feature provides a distinctive function for the genealogies of Genesis. They push the reader forward in history. The ideal in the genealogies is in, in the Bible is not backward looking to some glorious past or a noble figure with whom the list connects. Instead, it moves forward with the expectation of better things to come. At Ugarit, there were two lists of kings uh, that were published that are relevant here. One king list has on the recto Poetry with sort of tambourines and flutes for the, ple uh, for the pleasant one. And uh, Dr. Younger knows this very well. He translated it. Uh, the reverse has two columns where the second is readable with some 13 lines. 
in a sequence, again, going back to the earliest king, if you're moving, uh, not forward in time, but backward in time. Each is a god. Uh, that means either they're considered divine at this point, they're related to the deity, or they're simply dead. And oh God, I, a lot of discussion about that. Like Genesis 5 and 11, the context is religious, but no family or chronological relationship is identified. Second list of kings from Ugarit also occurs in a religious context. It's a list of patrons of the Ugar Ugaritic dynasty commemorating the accession of ha Amurabi, the last king of Ugarit. And there's a feast with Rephaim. Its preface is disputed, but this one and the other one from Ugarit, the closest king list to the ancient Israel, have religious contexts, just as those in Genesis have a religious or larger religious context. The 1966 publication of the Hammurabi list in comparison with the Assyrian king list includes conflations and names that appear in one list and do not appear in the other list where you have similar names. Gats do appear in these lists. They, we, are gats also in the Ugaritic list? Well, we don't know because they're broken and we have nothing to compare them with as far as the earlier periods are concerned. So, if we look at the evidence in terms of biblical chronology, there's a difference between the Seth and Shem genealogy. Shem's line never totals the ages, unlike Seth's line. If it matters that these two genealogies are different from others, then it matters also that they are different from one another, which brings us to the point that you have to compare or look at each genealogy on its own. Whoops. I uh, see. Given the unique nature of these genealogies and requirements and here, I'm not going to repeat what Dr. Barrick so aptly described the Hiphal form, Holid, and its usage in a number of texts where it doesn't necessarily have to mean begot the next generation. Um, da -da -da -da, uh, uh, and so, oh, uh, would add, however, that in, one, in Genesis 1 to 11, the Hiphal of Eliad only occurs in chapters 5 and 11, except 610, which is a continuation of chapter 5. It does it in terms of the genealogy. There are no other usage of this verb. Form occurs in 1 to 11, and then there's only eight other occurrences in the entire Pentateuch, of which 2545 clearly uses Holid in the sense of a whole family and a larger extended family and not just a single generation. I hesitate to draw conclusions, therefore, about Holid restricting it to biological sons. Not the only literary argument for an ungapped linear and chronologic sequence in the genealogies, but it does ask questions about the meaning and purpose of the numbers and names in these texts. Now, in the Hebrew text of Genesis is reliable and old, as we learned about, uh, so I don't really need to go over this, and uh, Dr. Barak took us through all the year years and everything else and how they're different and why they might, and Jeremy Sexton's theory that the Septuagint ex ex expanded the chronology in order to, to, to say this predates the Egyptian chronology, which by the time the Septuagint was translated, especially if it was translated in Egypt, was uh, maybe important for them. Canaan in the Septuagint of Genesis 11 appears as a successor of Arpachshad and a predecessor of Shelach. The Masoretic text does not know of Canaan here, but the Septuagint preserves it in all the relevant places. If the name is not original, how did it get into the Septuagint? And this is where I'm going with this, by the way. Now, I want to look at this odd Canaan guy who shows up as the son of Arpachshad. How does it get there? If the name was original, then there is a gap in the Masoretic text. Something unusual is going on at the beginning of Shem's line. There is also an irregular, irregularity in the form, which Dr. Barak pointed to. The normal form is why he, A, lived X years and begot B. You got your preterite. Uh, he lived, and then A and B. This signals both moving on to the next generation. Every generation from Adam and Terah, except Arpachshad and Shelah, have this form. Only Arpachshad and Shelah have Chai. Chai is not a normal form. Not only isn't it the preterite or the uh, Vav consecutive, but it's a shortened form of, of what, uh, it seems to be a shortened form, an apocopated form of a third masculine singular cow perfect, the same root as Yihi. Why? I don't know. It's not clear. But it's there. It's unusual. And it marks it along with Canaan, who sits in between those two, Arpachshad and Shelach. Now, if we, do, if we look at the names themselves, the personal names themselves, again, there's something interesting that comes up here. 
And that's what I want to do. Do the elements, the second bullet point, of the name occur at one or more times in the well-tested history of names in the ancient Near East? Names in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 are not attested in later Israelite or, Jew or Jewish names until the Roman era. A few examples of Adam and Sarah, but that's pretty much it. Names come from before or outside of Israelite and Jewish naming practices of the first millennium BC. These are not simply names that somebody thought up in the middle of the first millennium BC and stuck them into uh, Genesis to make up a, an, an early history of uh, the background to Abraham. My studies in the personal names of Genesis 1.11 provide the details of what I can only summarize here. And you can see those are the names that appear in Genesis 5. I'm not going to read them. Uh, the West Semitic etymologies uh, exist for all of them except Canaan and Lamech in Genesis 5. Canaan is a, is a kofiod nun root, which appears in names and nouns in South Arabian, meaning metalsmith. And we don't have pre-8th century South Arabian inscriptions, so we don't know how far back that goes. Lamech is unknown. Selah in Methuselah, and along with Enosh, Enoch and Noah, do not occur in other names from any known period. They're unique. And the other names are commonly attested except two, Adam and Me the Methu element in Methuselah, the first element. These two occur only in the second millennium BC. They don't occur in names in the first millennium BC. So where we can test it, the names are early, or at least they're pushed back earlier. Shem's genealogy in Genesis 11, you have the names there. Canaan and Shelah were already discussed. The elements of these different names occur earlier. A number of the names you can see in the second bullet point are attested as place names in North Syria and South Turkey at various times. But our pox shot stands out. There is no known etymology and no onomastic period in which it or its possible elements occur. In fact, we don't even know what elements make up this name. Uh, you, you do have this odd ar pa shad in the Hebrew, a consonant plus patak vowel plus consonant closing the syllable three times, ar pa shad, which suggests maybe Genesis 11 was compiled, by the time it was compiled, the pronunciation had been forgotten, and in its place, a three syllable repetition of the ah vowel was used. I don't know, but something's going on there. Ab pa shad in Genesis 10.22 is placed in the context of four other names that are his brothers, but these are all place or people group names. So what is Arpachshad? Genesis 10.24 mentions Arpachshad as the father of Shelach in a manner not unlike Egypt as the father of the Ludites and the Ammonites, Canaan as the father of Sidon, Hittites and Jebusites, which are all people groups and city uh, gentilic type names. So I don't know anything more about the name Arpachshad. Could it be a people group name? Could it be something else? The evidence points to a word that does not require interpretation as a single personal name. So in conclusion, there are multiple pieces of evidence that question whether one can assert without doubt that there are no gaps anywhere in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11. Gaps do occur in early West Semitic kinglets outside the Bible. Although different from the biblical genealogies, these kinglets remain closer in form and context to the biblical genealogies than any other sequence of persons moving chronologically through time. Further, it has not been demonstrated that the grammatical forms employed in the genealogies must define a biological father-to-son relationship in every instance. The large chronological periods of time, those that the biblical text does describe in its later chronological overview of the whole history of humanity, and I don't go into this, but you get these there, there is a sense in which human history from the biblical standpoint is divided into these large, like 500 year, four or 500 year groups, periods of time. Uh, look at 1 Kings 6 1 as an example of that in, uh, for, for the uh, date of the building of the temple, which, which is seen in a, in a similar way vis a vis the Exodus, and then the exile, and so forth. Uh, describe the later chronological overview of the Holy Do not exhibit the, but those do not exhibit the precision of specific dates. Text critical study of the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 results in some differences of chronology between major textual traditions, such as the Masoretic and Septuagint. For the most part, the names are consistent and in order. However, the appearance of Canaan between Arpachshad and Shelach in the Septuagint and other traditions, as well as in the New Testament genealogy of Jesus in Luke, raises significant questions about whether there may be a seam, 
in the genealogy at this point. And that's what I basically wanted to leave you with. This is my argument that something funny is going on there. Uh, text critically, there's an oddity there, as I've just pointed out. Grammatically, with that high form, there's an oddity. And in terms of the name Arpakshad, there is an oddity. So when you put all of that together, something strange is going on. In all this, we cannot prove that there are gaps in the genealogies. Rather, we can ask questions that have not been answered to date by the models provided. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hess. <clears throat> the next speaker is Dr. Peter J. Lightheart. He is the president of the Theopolis Institute, a Christian study, study center and leadership training institute in Birmingham, Alabama, and an adjunct senior fellow of theology at New St. Andrews College, Moscow, Idaho. He is the author of many books, including Gratitude and Intellectual History, Traces of the Trinity, and most recently, The End of Protestantism. Dr. Lightheart has served in two pastorates. He was the pastor of Reformed Heritage Presbyterian Church, now Trin Trinity Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama, from 1989 to 1995, and was pastor of Trinity Reformed Church, Moscow, I Idaho, from 2003 to 2013. In 1998, he received his PhD at the University of Cambridge in England. He and his wife, Noel, Noel have 10 children and nine grandchildren. Welcome to the Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, present. Uh, thank you for including me in this. I am an interloper. Uh, there are two scholars who have worked on the genealogies, and I wrote a couple of blog posts about the genealogies, so that's how I got into the, into the mix. Um, I do a lot of biblical work, but I do biblical work as a theologian, so the kinds of things I'm looking for and the kinds of things I notice tend to be uh, more the theological uh, dimensions and the theological implications of particular texts. Um, one of the papers that uh, I read in, in, uh, to prepare for this, I can't remember whether it was Dr. Barrick's or Dr. Hess's paper, but uh, one of them uh, mentioned at the beginning that these are passages that preachers rarely preach on, and perhaps what I'm here for is to suggest some ways that genealogies might become preachable. Um, I'm not looking at the Genesis genealogies, in spite of this being the creation project. I'm going to be looking at the uh, genealogies in 1 Chronicles 1 through 9, and not really in a great deal of detail. This is, uh, I'm going to highlight certain features of those genealogies that I think hold some uh, significant substantive implications, theological implications, uh, rather than try to sort through the historical issues uh, as the previous papers have done. Uh, there are three things that I want to look at uh, very briefly. Uh, the first is the literary structure of the genealogies in Chronicles and what that might tell us about the themes of Chronicles and what the Chronicler's about. Uh, secondly, I want to look at something, at some, uh, in, uh, again, very briefly, at the variety of material within the genealogies. Uh, we see at the beginning of 1 Chronicles 1 that there's a genealogy coming, and we got to go on uh, autopilot through the rest of the first nine chapters until we get to... Uh, get to uh, something juicy like Saul's death. Um, but as you, as you probably know, if you've taken the time to actually read through the genealogies, there, there's, not, there's not just genealogical information, in Chronicles at least. There's also information, there's uh, little vignettes, narrative vignettes, and there are recurring patterns, as I'll try to show, within the genealogies themselves that hold some theological and thematic content. And then lastly, I want to make a few comments about the the uh, kind of future-oriented oriented trajectory of biblical genealogies in general, uh, kind of along the lines of what uh, Professor Hess has uh, just described. And in each case, I'm going to be looking at these within the near context of First and Second Chronicles, how the genealogies introduce certain themes that are going to be developed throughout Chronicles, and then also in the broader context of the Christian canon, and eventually, you know, life, the universe, and everything, uh, how the genealogies fit into that. So first of all, the form of the genealogies, I don't have a I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I should have put, made a slide of this, but uh, the genealogies that open First Chronicles, a lot of scholars have suggested, are organized in a chiasm. Uh, 
uh, there's a genealogy, pre-Israel genealogy at the beginning, the first, uh, the, the, uh, uh, most of the first chapter, uh, after ch uh, chapter 9, the genealogy in chapter 9, which closes the genealogical section, is a genealogy of its uh, list of Israelites who come after the exile. So it's a new Israel that's coming. Uh, the genealogy of Israel itself is framed by the genealogies of the two royal tribes. It begins with Judah's genealogy and ends with Benjamin's genealogy. And then uh, nearer to the center, you have what Dorsey, David Dorsey calls peripheral tribes on either side of a central section, which has to do with the Levites. So the significant thing about this structure I want to suggest is that you have, uh, well, I think there are several significant things about the structure, but particularly that you have the Levites at the center. Uh, Israel's founding father, Abram, is introduced also at the end of a chiastically arranged genealogy right at the beginning of the book. The first 27 verses of First Chronicles are framed by two lists of uh, ten generations. We've already had allusions to this, uh, Adam to Noah and then Noah to Abram. Uh, within that, you have Noah's sons listed in verse 4 of 1 Chronicles 1 in the list, in the way, that, in the order that we normally see them, Shemham, Japheth. But then when the detailed genealogies are given, they go in the reverse order in Japheth, Ham, Shem. So the whole of those first 27 verses are arranged uh, chiastically as well. The, the all Israel that's literarily assembled in the opening pages of Chronicles is a universe, it's set within a universal context. The, the genealogy of Chronicles begins with Adam. If you look at Chronicles as a whole, it ends with uh, Cyrus and the decree of Cyrus. So uh, the genealogy is set within this overall context that's uh, Adam, pre-Israel, and a Gentile ruler at the end. And I think that, that itself is significant. Biblical cosmogony and anthropogony uh, don't claim Israel as the primordial nation as some ancient uh, religious religions did. Uh, Egypt is the first form of humanity. Rather, Israel is chosen from within a wider humanity that begins with Adam. But according to the chronicler and the way the chronicler has organized the genealogy, this doesn't diminish Israel's role among the nations, but rather the structure highlights Israel's role. One of the ways it does that is by the placement of Abram uh, at the end of a, a, a second ten-generation list. You have Adam, the founder of the human race. You have Noah, ten generations later, the re-founder of the human race after the flood. And then ten generations after Noah, you have Abram, as uh, the, uh, another refounder, he's a new Adam, a new Noah. Humanity reboots with Abram as it did with Noah. The genealogical structure, I think, also portrays Israel's specific role among the nations. The Levites are at the center of the genealogy, and more specifically, I think the center of the center is the list of the Levitical musicians and singers that are appointed by David, which becomes a major theme of Chronicles, especially in the early, in, during David's reign in First Chronicles. Uh, the singers, the list of singers is embedded within First, First Chronicles 6 between the genealogies of the three clans of the Levites on the one side and the priests on the other, and then you have the list of uh, the different groups of musicians right at the center. The fact that the Le Levites are at the center of the genealogy that starts with Adam and also the center of the genealogy of Israel suggests something about the calling of Israel, the vocation of Israel, uh, specifically their vocation, as we know elsewhere in the Old Testament, as a priestly nation, with the gloss in Chronicles, I think, that being a priestly nation means offering a sacrifice of praise, and to being, being a priestly nation means being a choral nation. And perhaps we might even uh, speculate on the, 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 uh, the way that this sets up a, a, particular, a particular anthropological perspective. Uh, the genealogies begin with Adam, the first man, the center of the genealogy, the climax, as it were, of Israel's genealogy is the uh, list of Levitical singers. Israel exhibits the destiny of humanity, which is to be gathered as the creator's choir and orchestra in his house. And I think you can not only see that going on in various places in Chronicles, but uh, in Revelation, the, the martyrs are, the reward of the martyrs is that they get to sing with the angels. Uh, priests and Levitical musicians are at the center of the genealogy. Kings are at the, are at the margins, at the edges. Israel's genealogy begins with the lengthy family tree of Judah and ends with the genealogy of the original royal tribe, Benjamin. William Johnston, in his commentary on First and Second Kings, describes repeatedly describes Israel's kings as playing a sacramental role. Uh, they're Yahweh's sons. They sit on Yahweh's throne. They lead the Lord's hosts into battle. The Davidic kings are effective signs of Yahweh's reign over the nations. And I think in, within the genealogies, uh, uh, I think you have something of a, a literary portrait, almost a pictograph of the ordering of Israel. You have a, 
portrayal of the polity of Israel with the royal tribes at the margins surrounding the and protecting the margins of the borders around the priestly people and particularly the ministry of praise at the temple. As I mentioned at the beginning, the uh, content of the genealogies and chronicles is not strictly genealogical. Uh, the genealogies differ in their form and in their content. Some, some portions of the genealogies consist of just lists of names without any indication of the relationship between the different names. Some sections list sons, some sections list begetters, fathers. Mothers are included and wives occasionally. Uh, sisters are sometimes included as well. Uh, but the chronicler's genealogy includes also narrative vignettes that initiate certain themes of the chronic, uh, that the chronicler is gonna develop elsewhere. And I wanna take two examples from the genealogy of Judah to illustrate the kinds of uses that the chronicler makes of this, these extra genealogical, uh, this extra genealogical data. The first is not a narrative vignette, but rather a repeated pattern that is uh, evident in the genealogy itself within the genealogy of Judah. Uh, Judah, of course, is the fourth born son of Jacob, but he becomes preeminent above his brothers. He, it's the first genealogy, genealogy that's listed, and there's actually a notice that he is kind of the replacement. Uh, uh, he's uh, the preeminent one after his older brothers, uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, were disqualified for different reasons that we read about in the book of Genesis. Uh, the genealogy of Judah occupies three chapters. Emphasis is placed on the descendants of Perez, uh, who was himself a replacement firstborn to Judah. Judah was a replacement firstborn. Uh, and Perez is the replacement firstborn. You know, uh, his brother starts to come out, and then he shoots, shoots by his brother uh, through the, uh, Judah's daughter-in-law, Tamar. And the genealogy is structured chiastically. I won't describe that, but it centers on uh, the genealogy of Perez. Uh, which is divided into several subsections according to his sons. One of the things that comes out of this is the uh, pattern of death and uh, renewal that uh, is uh, evident in the genealogy of, of Judah. Uh, death becomes prominent in, uh, or is mentioned actually in Chronicles, only uh, it's, it's mentioned first in connection with the king list of Edom in, uh, at the end of 1 Chronicles 1, uh, verses 43 to 51. The moat is used eight times within uh, eight verses. Uh, that, the Edomite kings reign and then die. They die, moat, 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 over and over again. The chronicler is hinting at a connection between death and kingship that I think is borne out in a number of ways in Chronicles, but uh, particularly in the genealogy of the royal tribe uh, of Judah. Members of Judah's tribe, we know, die for their wickedness right at the beginning of Judah's history. Uh, and according to the chronicler, Yahweh himself is involved in those deaths. Uh, First Chronicles 2, 1 through 4 it's the beginning of the genealogy of Judah. It's also Yahweh's first explicit appearance in the book. And in his first appearance in Chronicles, in Chronicles Yahweh is not a creator, but a killer. Uh, he's the judge and executioner, and particularly a killer of descendants of the royal tribe of Judah. So with this, uh, you have both the repeated use of moats in the uh, king list of Edom, and then you have the beginning of the, the royal tribe of Judah and God killing people, God killing the sons of, of Judah. Uh, there's a message about death and kingship, I think, that's being suggested there. Uh, death, uh, kings are of the flesh, fleshly. Uh, they die, which is why you need new kings to take their place. They can't reign perpetually because death prevents them from continuing to reign. But in, unlike uh, Edom's genealogy, which is mot, 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 death, 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 Judah's genealogy is largely a record of rebirth. The first uh, descendants of Judah are put to death and there seem, seems, it seems that Judah's uh, line of descent has been interrupted. Yahweh puts Ur to death. None of the other sons that are listed seem to uh, have sons. Onan is mentioned. We know that Onan was killed uh, because of his disobedience. In Chronicles, Shelah's line is uh, literarily, at least, aborted. There are no descendants from Shelah. Uh, but Judah's stillborn lineage gets a new lease on life through Tamar. Uh, his presumably Gentile daughter-in-law, with whom he bears a son, and bears the twins Paris and Sarah. So there's a, an end to a series of a series of sons are born. They have no they have no descendants, and then a new uh, line of descent comes when uh, Judah uh, uh, have fathers sons with his own daughter-in-law, who's a, a presumably a Gentile. Then the pattern starts over again. Zerah's sons are listed, but then Zerah's genealogy disappears. The last mention of Zerah's descendants is Achan. Uh, we know how he ended. Uh, he's the trouble of Israel who violated the ban. Chronicles tells us stoned for his sin. Uh, 
Zerah, whose name means something like rising and puns on the word, the Hebrew word for seed, is not a fruitful line from Judah. It's another false start. It's another blind alley for Judah. Judah's immediate sons die, and then one of the twins that come from Tamar, the line dies out, at least as far as Chronicles is concerned. But Perez breaks through. He's a breakthrough son from the beginning, uh, and he has a, a series of sons. And, but in a, number of, in a number of instances, we have lines coming from Perez that come to an end or seem to come to an end. Uh, Jeremiel's line through Omim uh, stalls three times over. One line goes from Onam to Seleb, and he died without sons, uh, Chronicles tells us. Another line runs through Jether. He also died without sons. This is a recurring theme. Shishan also had no sons, but his line is born again through his daughter. It's a repetition of the Judah Tamar story, uh, sort of. His line is reborn again through a daughter whom he gives to an Egyptian slave, Jarha. Uh, like Judah, Shishan's line is resurrected. Uh, like Judah's family, Shishan's line is resurrected by incorporation of a Gentile. So Judah's descendants assume the throne after a long history of near-death experiences. Davidic kings don't escape mortality. Like the, like the Edomite kings, the kings of Judah uh, from the line of Judah die. But uh, they're promised an eternal kingdom. Uh, and that kingdom is not eternal because it never dies, but because it rises again. Now, ultimately, in the Chronic book of Chronicles, from an exilic grave, but it rises again from an exilic grave because the line of David is actually beginning from the grave. I mean, Judah's line dies and then rises again, and Tamar dies and rises again several times in the genealogies. Uh, the vignette, the second example from the uh, genealogy of Judah is from the, the famous prayer of Jabez from 1 Chronicles 4, verses 9 and 10. And that also, that provides a kind of complementary perspective on the persistence of the Davidic dynasty. Jabez is named Jabez because of the pain, the Ozeb, his mother experienced in his birth. But as Sarah Jaffet points out, the name reverses the consonants of the word pain. Uh, and she thinks that is an indication that the, uh, although he's, the etymology is given as he caused pain, therefore he's called Jabez, there's going to be something about his, his biography that actually overturns that, which is the case. Uh, Jabez's name mimics the reversal of his biography. He's a son who's born in pain, but he's surprisingly more honorable than his brothers and leads a prosperous life. And we're told he escapes the fate of his name because he appeals to a power beyond the power of origin. His origin is not fate because he can call on a God who can uh, give him, uh, who can bless him. Having been called Kara, Jabez, uh, his only hope is to call Kara on the God of Israel who gives him this blessing. Within Chronicles, I think Jabez provides another glimpse of Yahweh's commitment to bring Israel and the Judaic dynasty through David, through the travail of exile and into an enlarged space. And beginning with Jabez and throughout Chronicles, we have prayer as one of the keys to the chronicler's political theology. What is it that sustains Israel through all her rebellion and through the judgments that God brings? It's because they can appeal to a God who can over, overturn the past and give a new future even when the past seems to have faded things for the future. The phrase in pain, as Javid points out, also alludes back to Genesis 3.16. In pain you shall bring forth children. Within the, the whole canon of scripture, Jabez is a child of Eve, a child of the curse, but because of his prayer and because of the Lord's answer to his prayer, he's delivered from that faded uh, Adamic uh, origin uh, and is uh, given a new lease by the merciful power of God. Jabez's prayer is set between the fall and, and eschaton that uh, provides hope. The third point I want to develop a little bit is the future orientation of the genealogies. It is possible that genealogies can function tribally. Um, uh, that's a, uh, uh, I mean that in a particular sense. Can function tribally in the sense that tribes uh, tend to look to the past as the anchor for the present. Uh, tribes look to uh, fathers to uh, set the agenda for sons. Sons are held has hostage to fathers. For uh, what I'm calling a tribal perspective, change is the enemy. Time and decay is the enemy. Uh, the genealogies, of course, record change through, ge through generations, but they display a continuous trail of natural descent from the past to the present. And so for this, uh, genealogies understood in this fashion, the present status of a king or a priest or a citizen is dependent on an original genealogical connection with some founder. And the biblical genealogies do have this backward-looking side to them. Certainly with the priesthood, you have to trace your descent from Aaron. Uh, 
But I think, as uh, Professor Hess pointed out, that they're fundamentally oriented toward the future. Uh, when Adam is given a Toledoth uh, at the beginning of Genesis 5, what follows is not the ancestry of Adam. He doesn't have one uh, except the Lord himself, but rather his uh, descendants, not his roots, but rather the fruit that he begets or produces. I think Toledoth uh, is indicating that. And in Chronicles 2, Toledoth, re Toledoth records recount the lives of chiefs and heads according to their generations, according to what they produce, according to what they generate. Uh, a, a few um, perhaps uh, wild, uh, undisciplined uh, speculations on what this all means. Uh, Chroniclers, Chronicles not only uses the, the Toledoth statement, the Toledoth term from Genesis, but also uses a phrase, a striking phrase, to describe sons, describe sons as heads of the fathers. Um, the word household is usually inserted into English translations, but the word house is not there. Uh, the sons are heads of the fathers. Now, that's an odd, odd way to describe a son. Sons are obviously subsequent to fathers. They're not the source of their fathers. They're begotten by prior fathers. But the phrase perhaps hints that the son is somehow the head, the source of the one who begets him. The sons are not merely extensions of their, of their fathers, but they're heads of their fathers. Perhaps the idea is that they're crowns of glory uh, that, uh, that crown their fathers as mighty men of valor, having sons. Certainly it's the case that sons secure their father's names because without begotten sons, fathers are not fathers. They're not begetters. So in, in a sense, the, son, the descent of sons um, is, a, uh, uh, is what makes the father father's father. This future orientation in the genealogies can be stated Christologically. Biblical genealogies trace a line of descent from the first to the last Adam. Genealogies end with Matthew and Luke. Fleshly qualification for priesthood or kingship or membership in the covenant people gives way to the indestructible power of the risen priest king who rises after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 7 says. And insofar as the genealogies are oriented toward the Messiah, they're oriented toward the future rather than the past. And this also gives us some indication of what it means to be a son, to be the head of the father. Abram's standing is finally founded not on his ancestry, but on his descent. What makes him the father of a nation is the fact that he is the ultimate seed, who is Jesus. The son of Abraham is the head of the father. Uh, and in general, I think uh, that's one indication that biblical genealogies lean eschatologically rather than protologically, and a hint perhaps of some uh, some way that the genealogies could contribute to a biblical consideration, biblical theology of time. I, I would be tempted, I'm going to give in to the temptation, I would be tempted to state the point I've just made trinitarianly. The father is only father by the generation of a son. Without the son, the father is barren and unfruitful, as Athanasius said. He has no Toledoth, he has no generations after him. In conclusion, the Chronicler's genealogies introduce key themes in his account of the history of Israel's monarchy. They introduce, I think, Israel's vocation among the nations as a priestly people, the central importance of the Levitical priesthood, and especially the Levitical musicians, which are introduced in Chronicles and Chronicles in our, uh, we have all the, most of the information we have about the Levitical choir and orchestra in the Old Testament comes from Chronicles. Uh, the miraculous survival of the Davidic monarchy is already, in, is, uh, uh, that's, part of the story of the whole book of Chronicles, as it is of Kings, but um, it's anticipated already in the little, little patterns and vignettes that we have in the genealogies. And I think the genealogies also uh, orient, uh, indicate an orientation to the future fulfillment of Israel's promise, of God's promise to Israel. So despite their prosaic appearance, biblical genealogies are theological. They are historical texts, but they're not merely historical texts, and I would submit eminently preachable. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to all three of our speakers. Now we're going to have formal responses each for 10 minutes in the order that they came in the first round, okay? So we'll just uh, follow up one from the other uh, and go from there. First of all, I have very little response to give to either of these men. Uh, I think that number one, uh, 
Dr. Hess and I both agree that there has to be some room for gaps in the genealogies. We use many of the same arguments. Uh, he did not get into exactly how much room there would be for those gaps in his presentation. But uh, as we look at the biblical text, I think there's an exegetical consistency there in what we're presenting. Uh, what I think in regard to our Foxod is that the name may have greater significance perhaps with regard to the Chaldeans. I wrote an article about that some years ago about the Chaldeans in Genesis chapter 11 and about the fact I felt that it was not really an anachronism, uh, that it was built upon the fact, or the anachronism opinion is built upon the fact that uh, some uh, adopt the Assyrian histories as being more authoritative than the biblical text. And since the Chaldeans aren't mentioned until about the 8th century BC, then they're ruled out as being mentioned in the correct chronology in the Old Testament. And I'm convinced that there has to be some sort of relationship there between the name of the Chaldeans before it underwent the change it did from Chasdeem to Chaldeans uh, that may be related to our Faxad. So I agree with Dr. Hess that there is a significance to that name. Whether it's related to the Chaldeans or not, I think that uh, that demands a lot more research about and it is something that uh, we can see more on in the future. Uh, with Dr. Uh, Lightheart, I agree wholeheartedly with the uh, theological emphasis of the genealogies. In fact, one of the things I skipped over because of my timing was the fact that I see a large number of theological lessons to be drawn from the genealogies. I think too often we center upon the difficulties of the numbers and the chronology of the genealogies, and we don't recognize and give adequate space to the theology of the genealogies. And he did a good job of pointing out some of the theological emphases. Uh, it demonstrates that all are in the image of God. It represents the human mind is continuing that way. It demonstrates that uh, the fall has its continuing effects upon all men. It also demonstrates God's attention to and care for individuals. Remember, Jesus is, is uh, described as one who calls a sheep by name, and God does not ignore. It's kind of like having a, a graduation here at the seminary, and if the dean were to stand up and say, okay, we're going to graduate all the graduates of 2017 tonight, and I want you all to stand and applaud them, and we'll all go home. And no one got the chance to march across the stage and receive their diploma and get their individual recognition. Well, God makes certain that he gives recognition. And in those genealogies, there's both evil and good because God's justice is also displayed. But his consistency in keeping his promise and preserving the lines of promise and bringing about the Messiah are part of the uh, theology of the future look, the eschatological look of these things. So I think there was a lot of agreement that we had tonight. And uh, I think one of the areas I look forward to hearing more be what these two men would think about the chronological arrangement, because I think we have some perhaps disagreement there that we have not really examined or talked about. Well, I uh, enjoyed hearing these papers and uh, learned a lot from reading them and hearing them. Um, I was really appreciative of uh, Dr. Barrick's uh, going into all the numbers, which sort of uh, is something I don't want to do. Uh, <laughs> my eyes tend to gloss over with those charts of all the different numbers. and. That's great that somebody has done that. So, uh, however, I would, I would, uh, my basic contentions that I've tried to present uh, are not af uh, affected by that. <clears throat> but I would say just a couple of things, maybe uh, in connection with his summary. I, there's a lot, as he said, that we would agree with. So why don't we talk about where we might disagree? Um, I, one, one thing I wanted to clarify there are obviously the different versions have different, in some cases, different names, but also different year lengths. The, these are not just scribal errors, and, and uh, it's Emmanuel Tobes' analysis that these are 
that only in these genealogies in Genesis do we actually have separate recensions, as opposed to simply scribal changes here and there which means that these differences, the Samaritan and particularly the Septuagint and the Masoretic as reflected in those, go back very, very far. And they, were, they, they reflect a whole thing. It's not that some, something kind of degenerated from a pristine original with slight changes over the centuries. Um, I also would uh, want to comment that uh, I take a, I accept a later date for the Exodus, and so uh, in the 13th century. So I think some of the issues may not be as strong as uh, Dr. Barrick brings up, but he did mention that there still are some issues with regards to the numbers. Um, as far as uh, a number of comments that he's made about the length of time, I don't know. Um, I can't say. On the basis of my understanding that there are at least a seam that I can identify and perhaps other seams or gaps in the genealogies, he may be right that there, we're talking about thousands of years we, or hundreds of years. We may be talking about longer periods of time. Um, I'm not able and I, I don't find a convincing argument with regards to that uh, as far as how far back in time that goes. Basically, uh, I don't, I tend not to um, try to place historical, extra biblical historical information anywhere before Abram um, as far as trying to connect them with realities. I don't try to date the flood, I don't try to date even the Tower of Babel and these other events. Um, and I think uh, those are the, that's basically where I'm at with regards to a lot of, of this material that Dr. Barrick has brought up. I can appreciate it. I'm not yet convinced that anything requires me to date within certain time ranges. Now, as for uh, Dr. Leithart, um, it's very interesting, um, and I'm not going to comment on the theology because that's a lot of fun and, and good and uh, some important observations. I'm going to comment on a page or two that I had at the end of my 1989 article on uh, the genealogies in Genesis 1 to 11, where I took to task uh, John Van Cedars, who, however, should be thanked for calling to our attention the work of M.L. West and her, Hes her uh, putting together the Hesiodic Catalog of Women. This is generally regarded as a sixth century document, a Greek, uh, which he then attempted to compare with Genesis 10. Now, there are reasons why he did that, of course. Uh, if you know uh, Professor Van Cedars, you know that he is interested in demonstrating that Genesis and the early material is a product of uh, an influence strongly by uh, the classical Greek historians of the 6th and 5th centuries BC. Uh, however, uh, while I have problems with that, I do think that this is a fruitful area for interesting research with regards to 1 uh, Chronicles 1 to 9. As I said, it dates to about the 6th century BC, although uses sources well before the 8th century, talks some about uh, uh, the union of male gods and mortal women. Okay, that's not going to work very well, but uh, it's traced, tracing them as far back as the Trojan War and to the very origins of the Greek people. Uh, when Van Cedars compared West's work, he, he, he noted that both that Hesiodic catalog and Genesis 10 were segmented. They were international in terms of their genealogies. They used place names and ethnonyms as well as personal names and they tended to have literary structures of threes and sevens. Now, uh, the problem with that is Genesis 10 has different genealogies with different starting peri periods as far as being segmented. It's, it has a limited number of nations. Um, excuse me, that's the Greek catalog of women. It has a limited number of nations, and it tends to privilege the Greeks. The Greeks are shown everywhere they go, then that's where they talk about other people and other people groups. They don't try to make a universal statement like Genesis 10 does. Uh, 
Uh, and they have, their genealogies don't go back to a common origin. They aren't interested in that. Uh, the big problem with West's work, or with, uh, with this comparison, is that the Hesiodic catalog is composed of about 245 fragments on 120 pages, of which no fragment is as long as five pages. So it's a lot of putting together stuff. But nevertheless, uh, I think if I were going to try to compare that with anything in the Bible, it would be with 1 Chronicles 1 to 9. It fits better with the time period. And it's an interesting analysis where 1 Chronicles 1 to 9 doesn't privilege the Greeks like the Hesiodic catalog does, but it does privilege the uh, uh, the Israelite people. Uh, and of course, it goes all the way back and then moves forward. It does include some, like the Edomites and others, who nevertheless are in that genealogy, but then everybody is if you start with Adam. So um, it, it does include some other people, groups, and nations, like the Hesiodic catalog does. And it does, it has that, uh, you, you weren't privileged to get the paper to see the chiasm. But the numbers three, 3 and 7, of course, is good in the Bible anyway. And you do have in both of your chiasms here seven elements in each one. So I think we can take that as an, as an interesting uh, starting point. Uh, certainly more work would need to be done. But it would be interesting, and as far as I know, no one has ever done it. To, to look at the Hesiodic Catalog of Women, which dates from roughly the time that the Chronicles was being written, and uh, seems to do something similar. OK. You all came to see something called, and the genealogies begat controversies. And you're not getting your money's worth. So <laughs> I'll try to generate something here. But first of all, I want to thank both uh, uh, Professor Barrick and Professor Hess for their papers. Um, let me make a couple of several uh, uh, positive comments, things that I really particularly enjoyed in both papers. Uh, I really appreciated uh, Professor Barrick's emphasis on the historicity of Genesis and uh, particularly the authority that Genesis has in uh, historical and scientific areas. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read a the last few lines of his paper, since he didn't uh, he didn't read the paper and didn't have a chance to make this point, I think this is a I thought this was a very well put. Uh, evangelical biblical scholars, Bible scholars, and pastor theologians must determine what the Bible says and does not say. Evangelical scientists need to take those results and seek confirmation of the physical, geological, and biological evidence. As the Bible guided early archaeologists to sig significant finds in Bible lands, because they accepted the biblical record as historically and geographically accurate. So the scientist needs to use the same Bible to direct his or her research. The creator's word comprises the highest authority, not the observations, interpretations, and theories of secular scientists with a totally anti-biblical worldview. So I appreciated that particular emphasis in the paper uh, and the, the, the role that he was assigning to scripture in, as kind of a, 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 an impetus for future research and as a guide for future research. Um, I, I appreciated uh, Professor Hess's Hess, Hess's uh, overview of the literature uh, called attention to a lot of things of which I uh, uh, was utterly ignorant and now somewhat less than utterly ignorant. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was very helpful and very interesting. I want to I want to get back to the numbers. I'm sorry, um, because the um, I do think that that's where the that's where the controversy is. Uh, there may be there there would be controversy. Uh, among specialists about uh, you know, the, the kinds of questions, that the, the origin of the names, the, the pattern of the names. There might be, there, there are uh, controversies perhaps about the question, in the question of whether there are gaps in the genealogy. Uh, most, everybody that, uh, uh, most everybody I think acknowledges that there are gaps in biblical genealogies uh, generally. Uh, but the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 are unique for combining uh, genealogical information with uh, ages, numbers. Um, and I haven't, I haven't seen an explanation of those numbers uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that explains why they can't be added up and turned into a chronology. Uh, 
Professor Barrick pointed out that there are a couple of places in the genealogy in Genesis 5, uh, Genesis 5 and 11 both, where you have uh, three members of a generation listed as being begotten by the father. And the question is, you're given an age there, which of those sons was begotten at the age that's given for the father? Uh, that creates some uncertainty about uh, at those points, at those, at those points in the genealogies with Noah and uh, with uh, uh, Terah, right? Um, the other ones, it, it doesn't, se that, uh, doesn't seem to, uh, there's no explicit uncertainty about who's being begotten at the age that the father is, uh, the age, of, age at which the father's name is given. So, uh, you know, I've got 10 kids. They're separated by 21 years. Um, you know, if I had lived 500 years, they might be separated by uh, a longer period of time. Um, but you're still talking about uh, a range within a certain generation. Uh, so I, I think that's consistent with what your conclusion was, at least, that you were saying that there's maybe hundreds of years, perhaps thousands, but you can't get hundreds of thousands or millions in the genealogies. But, I, but I'm not sure that uh, those two, at those two points, you have the possibility of, uh, uh, within the gene those genealogies themselves, you have the possibility of uh, extended time periods uh, at other points, it's not clear to me why, how, how that's the case. Um, Professor Hess mentioned uh, Jeremy Sexton's article. What I, undertook, uh, I understood his uh, article, the main point of his article was to distinguish those two issues uh, and to argue that a gap in a, in, a, in a genealogy doesn't necessarily imply a gap in the chronology. So you could have uh, such and such giving birth to somebody or be getting somebody, a lot, and that somebody might be a great grandson but still the age is given for the father at the time the other person is born. So the, the number is still there, and the numbers can still seem to be uh, uh, calculable to form, a, to form a chronology. So um, I, this is unfair of me to raise these questions to you when I'm the last speaker. Um, if I could cede time back to them for response, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I think the, the other explanations uh, uh, concerning Yalad, the flexibility of the use of Yalad, the Hifal of Yalad, are, I think that's recognized. But again, does that affect the conclusion about the numbers when there are actually ages given? I'll end with this. Um, again, a piece of theological speculation. What does it mean that one of the genealogies is dated and the other isn't? The other, one, one has uh, ages attached to it and the other one doesn't. Uh, you know, uh, Seth's uh, Seth's genealogy has ages for the fathers at the time sons or somebody, some descendant was born. Um, Cain's doesn't. Uh, Shem's has those, but his brother's genealogies don't. Uh, what might that imply, apart from the historical questions, uh, what might that imply about the, uh, what kind of message is that being put up? Is it perhaps the case that uh, whatever the Cain's and Lamech's of the world may think, um, they are not in control of the times. Um, the line of Seth, the line of Shem, uh, they are the true time lords. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. So I have a question here, and it relates very much to your question. Um, and so you may be cons considering now questions you would like to ask and go to the one of the mics. Uh, and get ready as I ask this question. But it relates very much to where this has ended up. B.B. Uh, uh, Warfield said quite a bit about these things. And once he said that the historicity, this is quoting, the historicity of the antiquity of man has of itself no theological significance. It is to theology as such a matter of entire <coughs> indifference. And it is a general fact that the genealogies of Scripture were not constructed for chronological purposes. Question, do you agree with Warfield? If so, why? And if not, why? So I'd like you to consider each trying to answer that question in from where you are, okay, in your, your study. Start with Bill. All right. Well, first of all, I would say I agree with Warfield when he states an anti-evolutionary viewpoint. I uh, agree with him when he talks about the historicity of the, the scripture account and of the uh, genealogies. I uh, think I slightly disagree with him 
in the statement that uh, the, the matter of the beginning of mankind is more theological and not historical in nature. I think that it's, it has to do with both. I think without the historicity, the theology begins to fail, kind of like uh, comparing the first Adam with the second Adam. If the first Adam is not historical, then where's the historicity of the second Adam? It's that just as so argument that Paul uses in Romans 5 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yeah, um, I'll try to kind of bring that I, into also what uh, Peter was saying. And these numbers are there, and they're presumably there for a reason. Uh, my take on it is that there are probably several different reasons why the numbers are included. In some cases, uh, like with Lamech, you get 777 years. That probably has a certain significance of, a, of, of an idealized length. Or 365 years for Enoch, which suggests uh, something very similar to a solar year, and perhaps in some way connected with aspects which we may or may not entirely understand now. I certainly would agree, and I think uh, your paper pointed this out, that the, the number of years pre-flood uh, drops considerably post-flood and may well reflect uh, an intention to teach something about the gradual movement away from creation and uh, the pre-sin state and the effects of sin as they gradually increase, even in the ideal line, for example, we don't know uh, with the family of Cain how long individuals in that line lived. Uh, we're only told with regards to these other figures. Although it is interesting, and I think the Sumerian king list would suggest this, that there was in the ancient world a memory of a period before the flood in which people lived longer. Uh, I also, uh, and I've I've alluded to this, and, and I argue it more in an article I published a few years back in, in the Bulletin for Biblical Research, which I edited, so they had to publish it. Uh, <laughs> but actually, it was blind peer-reviewed, so they're, they're, and I wasn't one of the blind reviewers. Um, uh, but uh, in that, I, I, I attempted to, to, to argue that, I think it's on the 77s of Daniel, and uh, Trying to understand that, you know, if you multiply 70 times 70, you have 490, that there, is these, there, there are these kind of broad sort of half-millennium periods that are intentionally placed in the Bible uh, from, say, creation to the flood, from the flood to Abram, from Abram to uh, the descent uh, into, uh, well, to, 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 to the Exodus, from the Exodus to... Uh, the building of the temple, from the temple to the uh, destruction of the temple, or the return to rebuild the temple, depending upon how you take that. But uh, Daniel is aware of this and tries to then project it into the future, I believe, there in, 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 in what he's doing. And I think what I, what I would say is that to some extent, these numbers, for whatever purpose, other purposes they might have, serve to put these gaps or these, these time frames in place without being too specific or worrying about that it falls exactly on the same day each time. Uh, so uh, those are some purposes that I would see for, uh, for, for the numbers as, as they are now uh, recorded there. I, I'm not totally uninterested in the numbers. It just <laughs> is uh, it's a challenge for me to... Yeah, to... yeah. Uh, in uh, response to the uh, Warfield quotation, uh, I think my answer would be uh, uh, much like Professor Barrick's. I think the uh, the age of man would be theologically theologically insignificant um, if the Bible makes no assertions um, concerning it. If the Bible makes assertions concerning the age of humanity, uh, then it must have theological significance. And I, 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 I kind of fall back on kind of first principles. What what is it? Uh, what is the Bible about? Uh, the Bible is an interpretation of history, and as uh, Professor Barrick said, if you lose the use the historical, then you're losing uh, a good bit of what uh, what the Bible is about. 
Um, the comment about the genealogies are not intended to be chronologies, um, certainly the case with most genealogies in the Bible, which don't have any chronological information in them, but then you do have, uh, you do have numbers in some of the genealogies, and those can't be uh, wished away from the text. They're in there for some reason. Um, my, uh, just a, a, a kind of question to, in response to uh, a comment that you made. I, there's, sh certainly there are uh, symbolic resonances to all kinds of numbers in the Bible, um, including, you, you know, uh, you, uh, uh, hinting at astronomical cycles. Uh, a 360, a year age of 365 years is, uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, he, he, he must be a sun in his, in his day shining because he's, you know, he's got the, the age range of a, a solar year. Sunny so, boy. Right. So the, <laughs> So, so there could be those kinds of uh, those kinds of significance to it, and I think there's that's evident elsewhere. But the question, my question is, uh, do we say that in a, in opposition to those those numbers also being accurate historically? Are we saying the the symbol and the his, history have to be uh, at odds with each other, or are at odds with each other? Would you like sure, to respond? Uh, sure, I'm happy to respond. We want to beget controversy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. I don't think it is a comment on the accurate historical value of these numbers. I don't know entirely what to do with the numbers um, because they are large, they are unusual, and they are strange. I do, and I, I, I forgot to mention this, but you do have that interesting text at the beginning of Genesis 6 which says, God said that people will no longer live any longer than 120 years. After that, the, you know, the years go down, of course, though Abram lives longer than 120 years. But the, 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 the significance of that to me is uh, partly positive and, well, mostly negative, I guess. Um, it is that God himself is seeing a reduction in years. So there may be quite a historical or literal aspect to these numbers, although uh, I still am not entirely sure what that means because they are so large. But uh, the other thing about this is you have three major, what I see in Genesis 1 to 11, three major challenges by humans to God. Uh, the, the, the Garden of Eden, the sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis 6, and the Tower of Babel in 11. And each one of these, I think, is in some way an attempt to become like God to break through barriers that are set. And the Genesis 6 one is most, I think, revelatory with regards to this. Um, and I, my, one place you can read about what I wrote is, is in the Anchor Bible Dictionary under Nephilim. I did the article on that. But the, um, in, in Genesis 6, I think what's happening, I take the sons of God like Job and, and others as some kind of spiritual or angelic beings or something that are involved. But the purpose of it is to increase the lifespan of humanity. It's an attempt to restart or reboot or whatever you want to call it, the human race, so that it will live longer. And it is again attempting to go against what God's will is, despite the fact that from our perspective, they were living awfully long. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, seeing no one at the microphones yet, I have a further question. <laughs> Um, what do we do uh, with the combination of facts that we have, if we accept the Canaan in Genesis 11, we would have 10 generations and then three sons, and then 10, or 10 generations and three sons again, both in chapter 5 and 11. And uh, the parallel that you were mentioning with uh, the Sumerian king list, uh, before the flood in the Sumerian king list, and it refers to the flood, and that's the divide. You have the big numbers before the flood and the sh smaller numbers after the flood, kind of progressively going down. And uh, the suggestion that's been made that uh, the large numbers, it's part of the genre of genealogies in the ancient world, and that the large numbers are there specifically to say that that was way back there, and the smaller numbers bring you down closer to the reality of human existence as we know it. In other words, there's been a lot of discussion about the genre issues. Is the Bible actually 
telling us uh, that there's a particular chronology that we'd be following for the age of man or the earth? Or are we simply misunderstanding the genre? This is the, the real question that needs to be asked here. So I'd be interested in response. What, what are your responses to that kind of argument that is out there in the literature? Start here again? Sure. <coughs> well, I think that the very pattern you have of 10 generations and then three sons, uh, and, and you can't forget that the three sons is not just the, the three sons of Noah, the three sons of Terry. You also have three sons of Adam mentioned. And I think that sets a pattern then as repeated or imitated as you go along. And there's even the intimation there, you know, with, with Adam's three sons, one died as a righteous, as Jesus said, he called him the first prophet to be slain in Luke 11, 51 and 52. And then you have Cain, the wicked one, the one who murdered and whose line is given in four. And then you have Seth, and that's the line that is given in chapter five. And there's an intimation there that there's going to be one son who's going to be favored or receive the favor of God, experience the grace of God, and be used in God's advancing of the proto-evangelium, the uh, promise he gave in Genesis 3.15, and uh, the others are not involved in that. Uh, so it, it shows a narrowing of the focus as you move forward in the line. <coughs> I think it's clearly uh, a, a pattern. It's a, a genre issue looking at it. I don't think that the genre issue necessitates that we suddenly see that it's not historical. Uh, because poetry can be just as historical as uh, narrative. And narrative can be just as fictitious as poetry. Um, we, we look at the Charge of the Light Brigade by Tennyson, and uh, it's one of the most accurate depictions in the Crimean War of the Charge of the Light Brigade that you have, and it's in poetry. And of course, we have Psalms like Psalm 105 that gives us history that is just as accurate as a narrative. So I, I think that it doesn't solve the question, the genre issue doesn't solve the question of historicity. It does solve a question of do we look for gaps? Do we look for patterns and significances? And I think the answer to that is yes. And I think some of that is going to be theological significance. Uh, two positions we've had mentioned already, a potential of the drop of ages before the flood of, of precipitously down 45%, where after the flood it's only 23%. Why so fast before the flood and so slow after the flood? Why aren't they parallel? Why isn't there a gradual decline? Well, you could attribute that to Genesis 6 conditions upon the earth that brought about a, a quicker decline, uh, or there could be that there's indication there that uh, there are gaps after the flood. I, I made the statement, I think, in my paper that uh, the greater uh, chronological flexibility is not pre-flood, partly because of the seeming solid structure of Genesis 5 and its pattern and use of numbers. The greater flexibility is after the flood. And that's what Dr. Whitcomb has pointed out as well. And whether you're talking about the Levitical line and the expansion we placed there, or even if you're talking about the Judean line and the expansion we placed there, I think we end up in Chronicles then, where Peter Lightheart has spent so much time. Uh, that that uh, is part of the answer there. So I don't know if that gets you exactly where you wanted to try to get me, but that's where I would land that, yes, the genre issue is significant, important. We need to study it. There may be theological issues that we need to resolve and point out. I don't think it changes the historicity. Of course, historicity is not necessarily think linked just to the numbers. Correct. You can have historicity without right. thinking the numbers are to be followed. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah it's interesting. The, when the, I think when the old Babylonian lists were first published, and Malamut came out and argued that, yeah, 10 is a big number important in West Semitic genealogy. And people said, yeah, but it, it's pretty iffy how you count the 10. And as you said, well, you include Cain and then you don't include it. And so um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not convinced of, of the, although I do think there is something to those numbers because I think that's picked up by Matthew. I mean, I think he was aware of it and so people were aware that something's going on there. Uh, the question of, uh, of, 
this idea that, you know, I, I honestly, yeah, I do believe that people had, uh, the early ancients had some tradition or some awareness of long-lived antediluvians. They interpreted it differently. I think for the Sumerian king list and that, they saw that as going back to uh, sort of the ideal time to which, in my view, they were wanting to return or at least to connect to. The kings were the ones particularly who had these. And so if you were a king, you were semi-divine in that respect. On the other hand, you have uh, the biblical view, which sees this not so much as an ideal to go back to uh, in the text, but as diminishing and as under the judgment of God as a result of Genesis 6. So if there's going to be salvation, if there's going to be relief, as uh, Lamech says of Noah, from the ground that the earth the Lord has cursed, it has to come from some other means. And that pushes it forward, uh, I think, to a hope. A couple of comments. Uh, one, uh, uh, agree with much of what uh, Professor Barrick said about, uh, particularly the, even if you determine a genre issue, that doesn't determine the question of whether um, you're looking at a text that's claiming historical uh, truth. So, I mean, virtually everything in the Bible is literarily patterned. Um, so if there were some, if that were a signal of uh, uh, a, uh, if that were a, a clue to it not being historical, then uh, there's a lot that wouldn't wouldn't be historical. I have to, uh, more generally, I have to register a non-specialist's um, skepticism, um, and I'm happy to be convinced otherwise. But skepticism that we know enough about the range of literature from the from this period to think that we can identify genres um, and that we can identify the particular uh, features of a of an you know an antique genealogy. Maybe maybe there's more available than I'm aware of. I'm sure there is more available than I'm aware of, but I'd just to register skepticism about our ability to draw those conclusions. Okay, question here. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, my question has to do with method, of uh, our exegetical method. I, I, it, this could have been just pure accident, but I noticed, uh, Dr. Barrick, at the end of your outline, you had a &E material. And Dr. Hess starts out with any &E material, and I wonder, you know, methodologically, and, and of course this this is a theological question too, in terms of, you know, modern interpreters, believers approaching the text. So I, I just like you mm -hmm. to reflect for us yeah. on your thoughts about exegetical method. Thank you. You're begetting controversy. Yeah, good. <laughs> I, I don't think that uh, either Dr. Hess or myself. I uh, disagree on the significance and priority of exegetical methodology. Uh, his emphasis and focus throughout his uh, study academically and everything else in this issue has been ancient Near East, so I don't treat your order as being imp implying anything about your theology or your exegesis. Uh, and I purposely began with that because I thought that would be my area where I would uh, emphasize and I was leaving the ancient Near Eastern to last because I knew that he was going to be handling it so well that I didn't need to enter into it uh, a great deal. So as far as methodology, I, I don't think we have a terrific disagreement there, I, uh, unless uh, you would want to voice one. But uh, I see a priority of exegesis. I believe that uh, the ancient, I, I don't look at the biblical text and say, I believe something in the text because it's confirmed by something outside the text. I accept the text for what it says, and then I deal with the seeming contradictions or support from outside the text. Uh, archaeology, history, ancient Near Eastern materials and comparative analysis does not generate faith. The scriptures generate the faith. And then the external materials can sometimes confirm, uh, affirm that, but they're not going to affect how I approach the text. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, the reason I started that way, I have an interest in that, and when I wrote my 1989 article, it was primarily interested in critiquing comparisons that had been made with uh, the genealogies and, and the kingless, and looking at that. And so I wanted to start that way to bring out certain things, and as I got into it, then um, 
I realized there was something unusual happening in Genesis 11, and then I, I focused in on that. And there, I used the ancient Near East, but I also used the grammatical, text critical, and onomastic uh, environments in order to bring that, which is really, if this has a contribution, that's the contribution that I'm trying to make with it. Yeah, my, my complete uh, um, avoidance of any comparative evidence is largely due to my uh, uh, my lack of knowledge of it. Um, so, uh, but I, I think there, uh, I don't think I would, I don't think I'm differing particularly with what they just said, but I would uh, want to emphasize maybe something different. I want to, I, I want to make sure that I'm looking at the internal coherence of the canon as a whole and particular, uh, particular sections of the canon. Um, at some points, um, a comparison, you know, even something like a genre comparison, if we can, we can think about, uh, um, if, if, we, if we can establish something like, like a generic pattern in ancient Near Eastern texts generally, or, or a cosmo cosmological outlook that would be common across the ancient Near East, that can be illuminating. Um, so I'm not disparaging that at all, but I'd, my interest is more in looking at the internal workings of, of the biblical text and trying to draw the theological conclusion from within that. And it's, and it's largely a matter of my, my lack of specialization in ancient Near East. Thank you all for wonderfully stimulating uh, papers and discussion. Um, I have one quick comment and that is uh, there is a brand new text just published, a Middle Assyrian text that mentions Chaldeans. Mm. Uh, and it dates mm. to uh, the 12th century. So mm. we have a whole new um, controversy coming down the road now because of that. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's important to, to note. Um, David Klein's in his uh, book, uh, The Theme of the Pentateuch, uh, talks about these uh, genealogies with theological implications. And in particular notes uh, in uh, chapter 5 the, the fact that the redundancy uh, is very powerful there uh, with death reigning and the um, uh, fact that uh, Enoch does not die. He uh, uh, walks with God and is not. So there's, so my question really is, uh, can you respond uh, to that particular observation? And this would tie in uh, with what Peter was particularly noting as well. Okay, thank you, Dr. Younger. Yes, I, I think it's very significant that you have death they're repeated over and over again in Genesis chapter 5. Uh, it's the effects of the fall, and I think uh, part of the theological focus of the genealogy is on that. It's uh, on the conveying of the image of God in man, the way it begins in chapter 5, but it also shows the effects of the fall, even though man has or contains the image of God. Uh, I think that the specific focus on Enoch is to demonstrate that God can intervene and that he can change the situation. I think there are other implications we need to deal with. I mentioned this in my paper and didn't mention it in the presentation, but uh, when we're looking at the ages of men prior to the flood, uh, you know, they're, they're so close to a thousand years, but not at a thousand years. Mm. And they, they decrease from there. And you look at uh, Enoch and he's taken at 365, yes, but it's as though he's in the mid, middle of life. Uh, but because he walked with God, he's taken. Uh, was he taken because that was God's design from the start, that when he placed Adam and Eve upon the earth in their unfallen state? Uh, did he really expect them to live on forever and ever, thousands upon thousands of years, and continue to bet, beget children? Or was God's design more the nature of perhaps they would spend 1,000 years as co-regents over the kingdom that God had assigned them in the mandate, and then he would translate them or transfer them to heaven as he did with Enoch, and that their descendants would continue on. And Could that be then why later the Messianic kingdom is given 1,000 years in the book of Revelation? Could it be that that's the ideal? Uh, could that be what God intended? And so since the first Adam did not fulfill God's ideal, the second Adam will fulfill God's ideal by 
ruling and reigning and living upon the earth for a thousand years. Uh, what else does that tell us? Uh, I think there's some study there that we could pursue and look at because Isaiah chapter 65 also mentions there will be a time when a man who dies at 100 be considered an infant. And that sounds so much like the pre-flood situation. And he's talking about a future messianic kingdom. So I think that uh, uh, Enoch is, is very significant there for that reason. God can intervene. It shows that perhaps God had designed man not to stay upon the earth even in their pre-fallen state, and that uh, perhaps uh, that thousand-year reign or rule was what the original design was. Some of that is speculation, but I think we need to theologically think that through and compare the overall text and see where we come to. The uh, iterative... Oh, there you are. <laughs> The inter Thanks for the question. Good question. Uh, that's, I mean, when, when I read that with, with David, I, I, it always strikes me the, the general sense, and, and you especially get this in the study of the lists, the town lists and so forth in Joshua, as you well know, 13 to 21, um, consistently the lists that are most regular are generally considered the most blessed. Uh, that is, they are the biggest, like Judah. Judah has a uh, remarkably regular list, and, uh, and it is the one that is, of course, from which the chosen Messiah will come and everything else. So the first thing that, when I look at the list in five and I see the regularity, I see there's a certain blessing to it, as opposed to the list in Genesis 4, uh, which is set up with all kinds of notes and other things. Now, there's nothing wrong, list can have notes and whatnot, but... But uh, the fact that it is set up that way and then segments halfway through suggests that this is not the blessed or ideal. Uh, of course, Enoch already in the, in the New Testament, uh, in, in Jude and so forth, is designated as seventh from Adam, not an accidental position or slot for him to have, and therefore blessed. The death, I think, is what everybody has said. I don't disagree with death as being bad. Uh, over against it is the whole lead, which is the uh, begetting and the next generation going forward. And so while, while that doesn't reverse the effects of death, it, it says there's literally still some skin in the game. And I guess that's where I would stop. <laughs> I don't have it yet. Uh -huh. and Thank you very much for um, all your comments. And I had a question for you, um, Dr. Hess, just about, uh, you made a comment that the Mesopotamian king lists um, tend to look backwards, they move backwards. But I wonder, it, you, you bring up the Sumerian king list, but you sort of seem to ignore it right here because it does move forward. And I just wonder, is, is, do you do that because it's not a genealogy, uh, quite like you know the Assyrian king list and Hammurabi and yeah, I, I, I think when I'm saying that, I'm not saying that the Mesopotamian king lists don't move forward. They do, many do, so I don't want to take that away. The Assyrian list is a good example for me, though, because it does move forward overall in terms of its... But the second part of it keeps moving backward. <laughs> it starts at the latest and moves backwards to the earliest in that second part. And so uh, with the Sumerian king list and some of the others, the emphasis isn't on they beget, they beget, they beget. It's on this king ruled, and then this king ruled, and then this king ruled. It's, it's, it's less of a forward, it's, it's less in my view, of a forward motion in time and simply a chronicle of, of the years gone by. But yeah, I, I don't want to say that they don't ever move forward. They do, uh, but not in the same way that I see the genealogies in the Bible consistently moving forward. Okay. I guess here's why and, I asked. And uh, one of, if yeah, I may, uh, the West Semitic lists where we can trace it, like the Ugarit list that I mentioned, does, does have a list that goes back to the earliest king. Okay. Now that's a religious purpose and other things, but... Do I have time for one more question? Okay. Uh, so I, would, I just want to follow up. So, because I, I wonder, the Sumerian king list, it, you, you talk about how it points back to, people are uh, celebrating this sort of golden age, but... Uh, it also seems to be about legitimization. The, the kings of Iceland, they, they don't have a genealogy per se, but they are trying to demonstrate their right 
to rule because of the transfer of kingship city to city. And I wonder if there's another comparison, another analogy there to what's happening in Genesis 5, in that Genesis 5, it actually does start with sort of this, it talks about the image of God, how um, Adam is created in that. And I wonder if there's a claim being made in Genesis 5 in which uh, uh, this, this title, this, this status is being carried through and a claim is being made on behalf of the people of Israel that um, they also bear the image of God. And then this creates, I guess, further opportunities for comparison with texts like the Sumerian King List. Yeah, um, no, I think that's, that's, that's very important. Um, I, it's, it's less even, in, and maybe I said golden age, I can't remember, I wasn't trying to, but it's less even that than simply trying to connect, the, as you say, the leg legitimacy of the reign that the current king, where the list always ends up at, is the one who has the, the right to rule because that person is in direct succession or whatever from the earlier ones. With regards to the uh, Zelim Elohim, uh, that is, a, of course, a concept that begins in Genesis 1. I think it is explicated in Genesis 2 and the sin, the sin that enters the world, and even the fratricide of four, but the sin of three, does not eliminate that. That's what five is saying, that it is still continuing. And nine, six then reaffirms that, that yes, despite a flood and everything else, there is still the image of God. Now, there are other things going on in nine, six, to be sure, but that's, that's the ideal, and that's moving forward. But if you look at Lamech's prophecy, if you look at Noah's prophecy, if you look at any number of these, they are, they are looking at, or, or even the Proto-Evangelium 315, they are all looking forward. And I see the whole lead, the hifil form of Yalad as pushing that. And so, yeah, I, I, would, I would see it moving forward to a realization of those hopes and expectations. Um, Oh, I go on, but I, no, I, okay. I just add to that very quickly. Uh, I see that mentioning the image of God in chapter 5 is reminding us of the, of the uh, vice regency that Adam and Eve have over the earth. And I see it as a message, one of the theological messages of many, that the kingdom program of God continues in spite of the fall. God's program of the kingdom has not been destroyed by the fall is programmed for the kingdom will continue. And of course, from the time of the fall onward, it has to be coupled with this program of redemption. Want to, want to thank our guests again? Thank you very much for the discussion. And thank you for coming this evening uh, with the weather and everything like that. But thank you for coming, and Lord be with you. Thank you.